Okay, it's, I'm not seeing anything. It says I'm live. It does. Um, yes, okay. Yes, Emily says I can be heard. I'm not hearing it though on my computer. I'm not hearing anything. You're live right now. Okay. So there you, I guess everything's fine. Anyways, welcome everybody to the VBF August 2021 Facebook, VBF Facebook Live with today's guest, Dr. Ana Duarte, who is the director of dermatology at Nicholas Children's Hospital. She's also the founder and director of Tibia, the International Birthmark Institute, which is a comprehensive vascular anomalies program down in um, Miami. And we're very excited to have you here with us today. So um, welcome. And I guess the first thing be as before we start getting questions that I'll ask you is, how is everything going with uh, COVID in your state right now? Well, first of all, Linda, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to meet up live and talk about vascular birthmarks. So I look forward to the next hour. And uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID right now is surging in Florida and our hospitals are full um, and we're pressing on. Okay. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm just having a little wonky issue. I'm, I'm not seeing myself on my uh, screen like I normally do real time. I see you real time, but I'm not seeing me. I'm looking at like, uh, I see my mouth moving. So I don't know what um, Emily's saying. Everything's okay, but this is really a little different for me. Um, I'm not seeing any questions and that's another thing. I'm not seeing any comments. So it says there's 14 people that are on. Dr. Duarte is ready to take your questions. Um, I'm okay. So I see Olivia Stasiak um, and five other people are watching. Hello, Emily says hi, Dr. Linda. Sithi says hi. Lindsay Benedict is watching. So Dr. Duarte is ready to take your questions. Um, we are discussing anything pediatric for vascular anomalies. It can really be anything for vascular birthmarks, anomalies, or related syndrome. Michelle, she's asking what we are discussing. So this is our monthly, for those of you who don't know, Facebook Live, where we have Michelle Zahn, Michelle, from your office. Oh. Um, so this is where we have families actually call in and ask questions and um, provide real-time answers from our experts. So uh, let me just take this out. Maybe this is part of the problem. Um, all right, so Amanda, how does the COVID vaccine affect hemangiomas? Your first question. There we go. So as far as we know, it should not affect it whatsoever and you should be able to get your immunization. But now, what age are, are we talking about? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't know. That's a good question. So Amanda, you're saying, how does the COVID vaccine affect hemangiomas? Are you saying in pediatrics for the infantile hemangiomas? Because it's not approved for pediatrics yet. That's yeah. why I yeah. had the question. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Olivia says, thank you both. Amanda's watching. So if you, I'm, I'm not sure, but so it's, Kind of if you're if you're eligible for the vaccine, you can and you have an infantile hemangioma or you have a vascular malformation in general, you should be OK to get the vaccine unless you're on a treatment that somehow is such as, for, for instance, a lymphatic malformation, you're being treated with serolemus, let's say in that case, yes, you should check with your doctor before getting the immunization. And it's usually what I uh, recommend is that my patients check in with me and even sometimes with their primary care doctor before you decide to go and get your immunization. If you are on a medicine that can suppress your immune system, uh, that's something that you need to vet, so to speak, with your, with your doctor and weigh the risk benefits. Thank you, that's a great response. Um, oh, Amanda says I'm actually 40, but I know a few kids that has a, a few kids. Okay, and um, someone has a 10 year old. So I don't know if the 10 year old had a hemangioma because it should be gone by then. So she was asking 
about in general, the treatments uh, for hemangioma, uh, which, um, which we use, should not interfere in any way with your eligibility to get a COVID vaccine. And um, okay, so um, with febrile seizures being one of the more common side effects with immunizations in general, why is it not more dangerous for those who already have seizures with Sturge Weber syndrome? The, the immunization? Yeah, um, she's talking about the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, if you do have febrile seizures um, and you have Sturge Weber, and I think you probably are at risk of having a seizure, you should check with um, your primary doctor, whether it's a pediatrician or a family practitioner to see what they recommend. Um, and because you can get some fever with the uh, COVID vaccine. Well, and also um, to respond to Michelle Salas, you can go back and watch the interviews I've done with Dr. Um, Comey regarding COVID. And she is absolutely adamant that any adults or anyone over the vaccine age wherever you are from that has Sturge Weber syndrome, that they really should get the vaccination because they are at risk, you know, for seizures just by the fact that they have Fever. Sturge Weber. So um, that was, you know, that's the general consensus of the um, neurologists for the patients that have Sturge Weber. Also, I've seen Dr. Delphinian say, people who have a uh, Clipotrenone syndrome, same, that they should get the vaccine. And we've had people contact VBF and say, can we get a letter saying it? And we just have them contact one of our experts. Um, I know like Dr. Cohen has provided a number of letters for patients that needed to get the vaccine or wanted the vaccine and they have a vascular malformation. Um, okay, so we have some more questions coming in. <laughs> same, same topic. So Sam Jaw says, is it safe for my baby to get a vaccine when baby is taking propranolol? Yes, I, I don't think it will interfere in any way with uh, the immunization schedule. And even, even in general, like um, with propranolol, it's not like the old days, right? Where they had the steroids and you had to be careful of live vaccines for all the immunizations. It's right, it's fine, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's what I, I, I wasn't sure if that mom was asking about the COVID vaccine or a general question, why my child is on propranolol, should they be getting their routine vaccinations? Yes, and they should, they should get their routine vaccinations, absolutely, on the propranolol. Okay, um, Adrian Eason says, my daughter has a mixed hemangioma. The dermatologist stated it was done growing at two months of age and is not at risk for vision impairment or ulceration, but he still recommended treatment and seeing a cardiologist. I'm worried about the side effects of the propranolol. Now, I mean, I'm a little concerned because he's saying it stopped at two months, but I guess anything's possible, right? Right, so at, uh, how old is the baby right now? Two months. Two months, so it's hard to predict the future. In general, most of the rapid growth has occurred by two months, but certainly the infantile hemangioma can continue to proliferate um, through the first 18 months of life. So I think it's extremely reasonable to go ahead and get um, clearance to get to use propranolol. I don't know, I would definitely uh, also have an ophthalmology evaluation. It sounds like it's near the eye, right, Linda, from the description? Yeah, that's what she mentioned. And I was gonna say, um, she's welcome to email you or me and we have, they can contact you directly through our ask the S expert at birthmark.org um, and also myself at vbfpresident at gmail.com. But I think probably the dermatologist meant that the rapid proliferation um, uh, may have already occurred, which it, it's true at about two months, most of them will have undergone that rapid proliferation. But certainly that lesion needs to be watched, evaluated by ophthalmology perhaps, maybe even an ultrasound. Um, I think a picture is worth a thousand words and certainly would be happy to evaluate that, um, like Linda said, by email. Right, right. Yeah, she's saying the baby's going to be three months, but still, again, these are completely unpredictable lesions. 
And like you're saying, we know historically the mega growth spurt is zero to 16 weeks with about 80% of the growth occurring in that period. So I don't know, just a little strange for me to hear somebody say, oh, the baby's two months, it's done growing. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was maybe misinterpreted a little bit. Yeah, could be. Okay, so we are, um, we, uh, oh, another question. Oh, there is a post, thank you, from BBF that says where your, where your email is. So that's great. Um, at puberty, what is likely, at puberty, what is like that the port wine stain become darker and do they cause pain on the limbs and extremities? So during puberty, will the port wine stain become darker and does it cause pain on the limbs and extremities? So at puberty, we might see some hormonal influences on the capillary malformation and there may be some darkening, certainly as the course of these lesions is that they will continue to darken and thicken in many instances. And it's about that time that we also see some overgrowth. If there's going to be overgrowth of the underlying tissues usually occurs at about that time and starts to occur in puberty. So um, this may or may not be associated with pain. Um, but certainly should be evaluated. And that's why we really uh, recommend early intervention, early evaluation to try to prevent all of this. And interesting that um, you mentioned about the pain. So one of the developments that occurred this last year, which I'm excited about is Novartis is looking at the pros, pros uh, syndromes, which is pic 3 c PIK3CA related overgrowth. So it's an acronym for PIK3CA related overgrowth. And this refers to um, lesions that um, create some overgrowth in part of the body. And so there's a medicine called um, Picre. Um, it's uh, that's the the, the trade the trade name is Picre, and it's um, the generic is Alpelicit, which is um, the medicine that inhibits this overgrowth. And so sometimes we start to see that overgrowth with port wine stains of the lip, of the jaw, of the extremity. It could be a clipal trenone. That is a condition that exists on the spectrum of the pros syndromes. So it's really important to know that we do have some new um, treatment options available. Um, sometimes we'll have to take a little tissue sample to see if indeed you have that pic 3 c pick 3 ca related um, mutation so that you can qualify for this medication. Um, but it is actually quite exciting. And we've seen, uh, at least reported, we have one patient on the medication now at our center. And um, we have seen in reports in the literature how nicely that overgrowth starts to become reduced. It may be very exciting to hear how you report on your patients that yeah. are on it. Because I'm I've been following it as well and very excited to hear that Novartis is taking the lead worldwide with, with this treatment. It's finally some hope for our patients. Um, another question from Melinda Anderson. She says, hello, at what age can a child get their port wine stain imaged? My son is 18 months old and has a small but stubborn port wine stain on his cheek. After 11, PDL treatments, so he's had 11 treatments and he's only 18 months old, we are losing hope. Our doctor made it seem like it's too difficult to image the birthmark while so young since they can't sit still. Is it worth getting his birthmark image to get a better idea of how or if we should proceed with tr treatment? So I think that it's not so difficult to get an ultrasound and see if they can pick something up. I mean, it has to be the right ultrasound uh, tip because it's for the skin surface. So it has to, the radiologist really has to know what they're looking for. Um, but if they can get through a laser treatment, I'm sure they can get through an ultrasound imaging. So um, I don't know the results. The results are gonna be very, very dependent on the operator, so to speak. You should go to a center where they're familiar with imaging the skin. Um, a lot of centers are not, um, but it sounds like you're doing everything right. You started early, 11 treatments. Um, to date, I think that that's um, a good amount of treatments. Maybe um, your dermatologist needs to look at the parameters and see if maybe they can adjust the pulse duration, maybe to get a little bit of uh, more depth. 
um, it, to the treatment. I'll just kind of look at the different parameters that you're using. I'm happy to take a look at those. If you want to email the parameters, I can offer an opinion, uh, but definitely talk to your doctor and see you know, how they're changing up the parameters to get more effective treatment. I'm really happy that you said that because um, one of our newest very involved parents, Sarah Ravitch went through this where she was seeing one doctor for the treatment of her uh, child's port wine stain and had like seven treatments with no clearance. Then she went to a different one. She went to Dr. G, <laughs> the king. And um, she was in shock at how clear it got after one treatment. So I think you're right. It's very important to look at the settings uh, who the technician is, you know, what's the laser, um, the whole approach to it. So thank you for offering to take a look at that. Um, Mandar wants to know, is it safe to treat children with port, pulse dye laser for port wine stain if family has a history of vitiligo? We fear triggering vitiligo due to the laser harming melanin. So in general, the laser is not gonna harm the melanin. In fact, the laser targets the blood vessels directly. That's called the theory of a selective photothermal lysis. So the laser goes right through the skin to the blood vessels. We do recommend that the skin is as untanned as possible. I don't know the skin type that we're talking about in terms of darker skin type, it sounds like you might have a little bit of a darker skin type, but we can take that into consideration when we look at our settings. But the uh, pulse dye laser the, does not target melanin. Um, melanin can get in the way, but it doesn't target melanin. And done correctly, it goes, should go right through the skin, right into those uh, uh, capillaries. So vitiligo can be triggered um, by any trauma to the skin. And, and there is a degree of thermolysis or heating up of the skin. Um, there really shouldn't be a lot of blistering or any significant visible trauma, but on some molecular level, of course, we're destroying blood vessels. So there is some trauma. Could vitiligo be a uh, trigger? It's possible. I've really not seen it reported in the literature. None of my patients have experienced this. And in, in, in the 26 years that I've been uh, treating port wine stains, I've, I have not seen this happen, uh, but it's an interesting question. Um, and I think you can kind of rest at ease though about it. Thank you for that answer. Um, by the way, there's a repeat question in here about the drug that you mentioned for the pros. And if you just Google Novartis pros, you will come up with their pay, whole page that talks about the generic and the labeled name of the drug and all of those. So um, we can get that information and send it to you, but you can also go right directly to the Novartis website and type pros and it will, it explains all about the drug. And um, I went, I actually went there myself to read about it because, you know, if we're going to be giving out information, I wanted to make sure I had correct information. They have a very nice little video that's um, yes. very easy to watch, very well done. Um, I would recommend that anyone that's interested in learning about that, just click on there like Linda said. Yep. Yeah, I watched the video. I thought it was great. Um, we're actually creating right now and we'll probably launch it in September. We are expanding our birthmark types and we're going to have a separate section on pros and a separate section on congenital hemangiomas because... Um, even though most of the patients with pros have lymphatic or clipotronane or something where you can get other information, we do want to have a separate section on pros just because there's so much happening. And I think the future of diagnosis is going to be the hierarchy will be throwing people into pros before they even say, is it lymphatic or is it clipotronane? It's overgrowth. Yes, so, correct. Right. Um, so um, here's a great question from Marianne. What are your thoughts on the XLV laser for treating port wine stains of the face? We have tried the Prima and haven't had any improvement. So I've been reading about this XLV laser. Are you familiar with it? I'm actually not familiar. So Linda, please, if you can chime in on that, that's great. Well, I'm, it, it's up in the air because the XLV is the blue light. It is the oh. blue light. Okay, so then, yeah. So I still think the gold standard is is a pulse dye laser system. 
can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So if it's a blue light laser, um, I still think the gold standard is going to be your pulse dye laser system. Um, yeah, I think I saw that come up on our chat and um, the, yeah, I don't think it's going to replace our, our, our pulse dye laser. Um, I, it's probably not going to do any harm and you can try it, but I think that you just, with, with ev all the advances that we have with the V-beam technology, uh, Candela is one of those uh, laser systems. Uh, Sinusure has its, uh, also its um, pulse dye laser system as well. Um, I think with all the parameters that we have available to us, we can really address almost any uh, capillary malformation with these laser systems really effectively. Some people will also use IPL. It's, it's just not really the gold standard. Now, does Sinusure make a pulse dye laser? Yes. And what's the name of that one? Do you know what? Uh, honestly, I'm, I, I follow Candela. I've been using Candela technology for probably 20 years. So I'm not up to date on that, Linda, but I just want, wanted to you know, put the name out there because they do have a pulse dye laser system as well. Yeah. Um, to me, the gold standard is Candela. And of course, I use the Perfecta and there's now the next generation, which is the Prima. So I can speak to the Candela technology um, from firsthand experience. Thank you. Um, so Lindsay wants to know, we have had a lot of hurdles to get treatment on our now nine month old. Waiting for appointments, doctors, doctor on maternity leave, insurance denying. We got his first treatment at eight months. Now they wanna put him under GA. Uh, we're not wanting to jump into that yet. So we are coming to the super clinic in October, which is awesome, they'll get to see you. And um, they say treatment right away is best. Do we still have a good chance of getting clearance with one treatment under our belt at eight months and hopefully more to come after our second treatment in New York City. So where is the, is the Port Weinstein we're talking about and yeah, where is it? The Port Weinstein, she just, she didn't say where, she just said it's on, she has a Port Wine, the baby has a Port Weinstein and is nine months. So the location is really important because we get the best clearance on the face. Um, the extremities are more difficult to clear. I think you're okay. We like to start early, as early as two weeks of age, but we can't always do that. I think you're still at a, you know, in a good time interval to start, uh, eight months. I mean, that's, that's good. A lot of people wait longer and we can still get good results, but we still recommend early intervention, early treatment. I agree. Um, Dr. Nelson always says it doesn't, I mean, ideally it's best to treat in emphases because the birthmark's this big, you know, it's tiny, like the baby's head is this big. So it's gonna be quicker just naturally. And supposedly those tiny capillaries respond, but the hope that Dr. Nelson says all the time is you can still get clearance. So don't ever give up on when you start the treatment, just do it and be consistent and stay in treatment until you reach maximum clearance. And she did have a second part to that question, Linda, about the general anesthesia. So I think that that's something that we debate about amongst ourselves as well. And it depends, again, on the size of the lesion, the location. But I think at this young age, you can get most of these treatments done in the office. And um, I think you'll see at the clinic in October that we'll be able to effectively address your lesion, your child's lesion uh, in the office. I usually try to wait at least until the child is over two years to go to the operating room because of the inherent risk of anesthesia. Can anesthesia, general anesthesia, be done safely before age two? Yes, of course. But if we can put it off, that's what I usually like to advocate for for my patients. Well, and VBF has um, co-author on a paper that's coming out with quite a few doctors on it about anesthesia, because in all of medicine, it's really only port wine stains where it's repeat treatments for infancies where you might want to use general anesthesia or do like you say, which is our preference, you know, in the office without general anesthesia. So I know this paper is going to, uh, you know, finally come out. It's a mega analysis of um, all the literature, a complete literature review, and it's going to make recommendations that are going to be like restrictive of how many laser treatments under age four, how many uh, general anesthesias you should have under age four. So 
I'm gonna task the group with coming up with some better pain management options for the children and the adults. I think that's what we need to be looking at. And I know there's a lot of, a lot of doctors have different cocktails of numbing. And I think we need to have like a focus group on that to have better options. So I, I'd like to talk on that for a moment. So not all anesthesia is created equally either. So right. there are centers will will do a full anesthesia with intubation uh, for a, a laser treatment. And so you, you there's a whole spectrum. So in at my center, we, we use inhalational anesthesia with a mask. Even amongst our anesthesiologists, there's diversity uh, in terms of some give more medications than others. So this is a really important conversation to have with your doctor, your dermatologist, um, and also with anesthesia. See what all of the options are, because I think less is more, even once you get into the OR, we can do a lot of these treatments very safely in the OR once the child is of age with minimal anesthesia, because for the most part, these procedures are quite short. The other thing that you touched on, Linda, is the topical anesthesia. We have to be very mindful of the surface area for application of the topical anesthesia. Um, so this is something to take into consideration um, when you're seeing your doctor, um, because you, too much anesthesia on the skin can lead to absorption and actually certain risks. So it's really important. Um, this, this anesthesia issue is actually a fantastic conversation. Yeah, I think what you just said, too, is with a lot of parents don't realize is when they use the topical and the generic that everybody knows of, which isn't a generic, is the EMLA, but it's kind of the one that everybody knows. Um, depending on how small the baby is or the child, let's say child, um, and how much of that EMLA, it can have adverse side effects. You're saying because it still is a numbing agent. And you're putting a lot of this in some areas on a, a, a large area on a small child. And you really have to be very careful because even though it's only a topical as compared to general, it's still not without risk. Absolutely. I, I would say that you're more at risk with a large surface area with a topical numbing than in a safe setting of an OR with a board certified pediatric anesthesiologist. So. Just yeah. because it's topical does not always mean it's safe. You have to be mindful of the surface area. Oh, I really think that's a like a very powerful um, discussion that we're having about this today because just the dynamics of everything changing. You want the babies to be treated earlier and then you also have to make these decisions. But let's always remember that the laser itself is not that painful. It's not right. pleasant, but it has a DCD. So it has it shoots out a cold liquid. So most children are gonna be apprehensive. They're gonna cry because they're being held tightly and they wanna move. And so right away, even before you start, there's gonna be some crying. That's not from pain, that's from apprehension, fear, anxiety of the unknown. Their little eyes are closed. This is not familiar, it's like to be expected, but the treatments are quick. So we get through it. I usually let the parents hold the child so the child feels a little bit more secure, more familiar. I usually will do like a little test site on the parents so they know that this crying is not because of severe pain. There is some pain, but it's not unbearable. And the laser has the spray that goes with every single pulse. So it cools the skin right before it pulses. So it makes it less painful. And the Prima has that cooling contact, the contact cooling in addition to that which makes it even less painful. So these, this, is, this is a laser, there's a lot of different lasers, but these pulse dye lasers are in general not that painful as opposed to let's say an ablative laser like a CO2 laser, which we're not even talking about in this conversation with port wines, but just in terms of not all lasers are created equally with regards to the pain that they produce. And this is a pain that can be tolerated. It's a fast procedure. Our spot sizes have gotten bigger so we can cover the area more quickly. Um, in the office, I don't think I've done a procedure ever that's maybe more than three to five minutes. Um, that would be a long procedure, five minutes. For the most part, you can get these procedures done in, in under two minutes many times. Oh, I'm so happy to hear you say all of this and also that you let you, you do the little zap on the parent's hand so they can feel it. 
Um, when we treated the children in Italy, I love that Dr. Coletti had dialogue with the kids and said, you know, let's count 10 zaps, then take a break. But he actually said to them, does it hurt or are you afraid? And they all said they were afraid. And most yeah. parents, even the parents are afraid because they don't know, which is why I love when I hear doctors like yourself say, I, I let the parent feel what it's like. And you also mentioned the DCD, which is stands for dynamic cooling device. So it's like spraying this coolant on it to kind of take to even lessen the pain. And, you know, we had one um, older kid cry through the whole laser, like hysterical. Then when it was over, Dr. Coletti said, just tell me the truth. Did it really hurt? And he said, no, I was just scared. <laughs> so there's a lot to be said and we're not minimizing that it doesn't have a little bit of trauma for some of these kids. But what you're saying, and I want to be clear, is it's not that painful a procedure, which is why it's better to not go through a whole general anesthesia for something that's going to take between 30 seconds and, and five minutes at the most, right? I think, I think absolutely. I think um, general anesthesia definitely has its place. And again, there's a lot of different definitions for general anesthesia from inhalational to intubation. So it's an important conversation to have your, with your anesthesiologist. There are different you know, options. In a center like mine, where we've been doing this for over 20, well, 26 years here, we, we have it down. We know what our patients need to get through a procedure. And like you mentioned, these kids are going under anesthesia once they get to that quite frequently. So it's important to minimize the amount of drugs these kids are getting. So to go to a place that's familiar, that knows how to manage these kids, it, I think is really, really important. Absolutely critical. Um, Stephen has a question. He says, I have a port wine stain that covers the majority of my face. Are you aware of any UK trials? I'm more than happy to and welcome to participate. I'm not aware of any. Um, we do have Dr. Coletti in Italy, and we can get you one free laser treatment with him. And then if you want to go back and have the, po he does the post-dye laser. He, um, VBF has negotiated a flat fee of 500 euros for any port wine stain laser treatment, no matter how big or small it is. So um, we're very excited about that. He also does the ultrasound diagnostic along with it to make sure there's no underlying malformation. So if you're interested in that, Stephen, you can message me, but I know I don't know, Dr. Duarte, do you know anything going on in the UK? Because I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. We can, we can ask though, we can ask in our chat. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so Christina says her two-year-old had an MRI last week on his port wine that's on his left arm which also has overgrowth. They discovered that he has a lymphatic malformation. He is being referred to an interventional radiologist for sclerotherapy. Can you tell me what I should expect? The doctor told me it can be painful, so I'm very concerned for my baby. So the baby's only two years, well, the baby's two years old, and it sounds like a port wine with overgrowth, so likely like KTS. Yeah, it's hard to say. I, I don't. I don't do interventional radiology procedures, so I'm not really so familiar with the pain level. But I think they will give some anesthesia um, to minimize that. Um, so I really can't speak to that, and I. I don't want to. I, I don't want to guess. Um, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, Elise has got a very similar one, but actually, she might be. We, I mean, we can we can ask Ricardo, and I'll yeah, get back to him. So I, I'm, I'm definitely willing to address the question. I just can have to address it um, after the Facebook right. Live. So Dr. Restrepo is her partner in her um, in the Tibia Institute, and he's the pediatric interventional radiologist and very familiar with vascular anomalies. So she can check in with him. But Elise has kind of like a tag on. She's saying her son has had three sclerotherapy treatments on his lymphatic malformation in his cheek. He doesn't seem to ever have any pain. Um, it can swell and bruise, but I wouldn't expect him to be in a lot of pain. So that's very, thank you for reporting that, Elise, so that um, that other parent can see that. 
because that's important that other parents share their experiences. Um, oh, so Tara Nesbitt says, I've had phenomenal clearance with Dr. Duarte after eight treatments. I'm blown oh, away. Hi, Tara. <laughs> we she, love said, Tara. she said she's blown away by the clearance she's received from your treatment. So that's a great endorsement. Um, Shay, okay, Shayla says, does all KTS babies need aspirin regularly? How can we know? My baby boy is eight years old. So I don't know about all KTS patients. So I think that's going to be on an individual basis. If there's any kind of coagulopathy um, in, in, in the individual patient, I can't, I can't say that that's a hard and fast rule, but um, usually it, we work together as a team. I'm a pediatric dermatologist. So that's a question we can get back to you on. Um, our oncology colleague that works with us in our team uh, would be the one to address that. Okay, thank you. Um, Madison wants to know, and this question we get every time we have a laser expert, so I'll be very interested to hear what you say. Do you ever laser a port wine stain on the eyebrow? Okay, I just had that conversation actually yesterday. So yes, the answer is we can. Um, you have to understand that the hair growth can be stunted for up to six months. So some people, are not willing to wait uh, those six months and they can have some apprehension. Is it gonna grow back? Remember your pulse dye laser is not a hair removal laser, but it can stunt the growth temporarily and it can take a while to come back. For the most part, I don't treat the eyebrow. Um, I will treat around it if I can use, there's a little spot piece, a spot um, a hand piece that is a little line. If I can get in between the hairs with that piece, I'll. I'll put a couple pulses in there. I really try to protect the hairs and the integrity of the eyebrow. Same with the hairline. A lot of the port wines go up into the hairline. We really just treat the skin surface in general. We haven't seen in, in my experience that um, there's that much hypertrophy or cobblestoning inside the hairline. Yeah, I actually just had this conversation with Dr. Nelson because I had an idea, but he explained to me the etiology of the hair follicle, because I thought, what if we have the parents use a white eyeliner pencil and color in the eyebrow, then you laser because then the laser won't touch the hair. He said, it's an interesting idea, but he thinks that the laser is gonna be too smart and go beneath the um, white eyebrow pencil that you can color on the eyebrow and just get to that follicle. It's just going to go for the follicle. Uh, I think that, I think, I mean, you can do a little test area, but I think that the laser will just burn through that. It's just yeah. going to, because you can smell it as it, as you treat, it yeah. does, um, does burn the little vellus hairs on your face. I think the, yeah, it'll just take it off. It's sometimes what I've done in the past is there's something called surgery lube which can um, render the hair a little invisible to the laser, surgery lube, um, and that can minimize that, the, the frying of the hair, so to speak. But in general, I really try to stay away from it. I'll have to um, talk to you more about that surgery lube, because I wondered too, like, is it like a Vaseline or Aquaphor or something like that? Yeah, no, no, it's not a Vaseline. Um, so it's, it, it, I think I learned that from Roy way back when. Hmm, very interesting. Um, Kim Brittingham says, um, Dr. G in, in New York City imaged her Port Weinstein and uses two different lasers. She's 48 years old and she's seen amazing results. So that's great. Another one said, Melinda said, thank you. We treat with Dr. Nelson. So I trust his treatment settings, but was surprised he wouldn't image the birthmark Maybe I need to push more, or I've considered going to the clinic in New York to get an image. Um, if you come to the clinic in New York, Melinda, what we're gonna be offering on Friday, so you'd have to make sure you get in for it for Friday, is the diagnostic ultrasound, which Dr. Kletty actually feels is sometimes better than you know an MRI because it tells whether the capillary venous lymphatic or arterial vessels are involved. So since you mentioned that it's 
looks like a type of KTS. If you do come to the super clinic, he definitely can do the ultrasound imaging on it. And it will give you, it will give you a perspective. So that might not be a bad idea. Yeah, uh, usually we want to start with the ultrasound and then move on to MRI if, if necessary. Right. Um, Ritani said, have you had experiences with cases that are not PIK3CA positive, but are still benefiting from the pic ray medication? So this is all so new that I don't think anyone has a lot of experience with this. But even if you listen to that little video clip, there's some of these uh, pros entities where the PIK3CA will be negative because the signal is very low and those patients will still respond to the medication. So it's not an absolute that if you're PIK3CA negative that you're not going to get the medication. You might still have the mutation, but just a low signal. So you can make the diagnosis based on the clinical findings. It's always reassuring when you get that uh, vote of confidence. You have that the gene, you found the gene, but you don't always find the gene. So you may still benefit from the medicine, even if that gene is, is negative, seemingly negative. It may just be a low signal. Thank you. Um, this is a great question. What are the best intervals if you're going to use a general anesthesia for treating a Port wine stain in a child? Like how much of a break should you do once a year, twice a year? So for general anesthesia, you can treat monthly. You can continue to treat as you would need to treat. Um, again, not all general anesthesia is created equally. So this is a conversation to have with your dermatologist and your anesthesiologist. Again, in most of my patients that are at the age where I'll take them to the OR and they need the OR because of the location or their own apprehension with the procedure that we can't walk them through it because we also don't want it to be a traumatic event. So at a point where we can't get through the procedure even reasonably well in the office where it's almost a danger to the child or the parents or to myself, we have the conversation to consider going to the OR setting for anesthesia. So again, we use minimal anesthesia. It is still considered general, but again, within general anesthesia, there is a spectrum. Again, there's no hard and fast rule of that time interval. It's something that you have to look at the individual child and, and create a treatment plan. Thank you. Um, Lissandra says, um, to please correct me, Dr. Duarte, if I'm wrong, but again, this is, this, we get a lot of this and we get, we've heard what Dr. Nelson has to say and Dr. Geronimus and your, yourself, but she says, isn't it true that um, with treating the eyebrow, the hair won't grow back as thick. So, so that's something to think about. So definitely um, there, there is that possibility and that could just be from maybe a little fibrosis of the hair follicle. It's still, it's not considered to be a hair removal laser. Um, but yes, there's that possibility that it might be a little bit thinner, but that might've been from the port wine st stain itself. Or if there was an infantile hemangioma, I often find that the hair is a little more sparse where the infantile hemangioma is as well. So it, it, it Scientifically, it shouldn't come back then or it should come back the same, but could it happen? Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is like the next question is the same with Kim. And she, you know, she's like me, she's a thinker. She's like, I offered to bleach my eyebrows blonde to Dr. Geronimus. And he said, no, nope, you know, I'm going to just continue to steer clear of the hair because the laser will find that follicle and doesn't matter what color, if it's blonde or red or, um, although Dr. Nelson says if it's red, it will, I don't know, have a different impact, but I don't know. I, I think it's something that I just hope down the road there will be a solution because it is interesting to see babies have like 90% clearance on their face and then you see a pink eyebrow because they're so yeah. skinned or fair haired. Um, so, um, oh, the, uh, one mom says she uses the eye shield, um, and it was not bad. Tara said it. <laughs> oh, so she used yeah. the eye shield. So yeah, I know you're 
oh, I wish we could just get every doctor to use the eye shields. And I know they're expensive, but seeing these babies walk around with bullseyes all the time is just so disturbing. I, I don't think it's the cost of the shield. I think a lot of people just don't feel comfortable putting in the shield and it's actually quite, quite easy. So um, yeah. I think more doctors should do it. I'm happy to train anyone that wants to learn. It's really quite easy. Yeah. Um, so another mom, she they were they're all talking about the eyebrow stuff. So she's like, I don't think about the shade of hair making a difference. My son's eyebrow hair is so light right now that you barely see the hair. Well, I guess that's good. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think like my own. If I had a port wine stain. And my eyebrow area, I would probably have it lasered and then use, I would try the little hair growth stuff that, cause I use the hair growth serum on my eyelashes in my eyebrows. And I've noticed my eyebrows are thicker. Like it actually really works. Yeah, the, you could use Latisse um, to, to grow a little Rogaine to grow. That's as long as there's not a permanent damage because of the heat to the follicle. Oh, I see, yeah. So for me, it wasn't from permanent damage. Um, right. Okay, so we have a long question here. I really appreciate you for bringing back happiness to my, I don't know who this person is. Thank you. Um, I don't know who this is. Uh, this is not related to us. I don't know what this is. Did you see this long post? It's, I don't know. It's. I don't know how this got hacked into us, but it's not related. Anyways, Madison says, would it be worth coming to the super clinic to get one treatment on the eyelid for my two month old? Absolutely. With Dr. Geronimus doing those laser treatments, you absolutely should come and get that. Um, yeah. And Dr. Duarte will be there and Dr. Nelson will be doing laser with Dr. Uh, Geronimus. So we have the two, um, the kings of the West Coast and the king of the East Coast with the queen of the South all coming together at Dr. G's office um, for our big super laser clinic. And what we right now have about 50 people signed up for free laser and we will be taking um, registrations right up until the conference clinic. So birthmark.org backslash conference. If you're interested in coming to our super clinic, on the 9th is the free laser. On the 8th is the ultrasound diagnostic free clinic and dental and orthodontry free clinic. Uh, Christy says her son has three facial AVMs and the mandible cheek and scalp. We plan to, she didn't finish, but I'm hoping she's planning to come to our super clinic. So Dr. Um, Elite, we are, oh yeah, they're registered. Um, well, we, what we'll do, what we need, Christy, is you to be there Friday for the ultrasound diagnostic and then let Dr. Coletti decide whether it's amenable to being lasered or not. If it truly is an ABM, depending on the location, I don't know. I don't know, Dr. Duarte, how you feel about lasering if it is, in fact, an ABM study. Uh, if it's, yeah, if it's an ABM, I think the general rule is to leave those alone. Uh, definitely don't try to trigger any kind of growth with laser. Right. So, but let's let, let's see what Dr. Coletti says when he does the ultrasound. Um, so Marianne wants to know if you've heard anything about gene therapy for vascular birthmarks. N not as yet. Have you, Linda? No, nope, but I look forward to the day. <laughs> I mean, one yes, thing I do know we found mutations for everything except the infantile hemangioma. So, and I think yeah, that's correct. So familial, you know, they're so familial. Um, who knows? But um, I think it's, I think I'll see gene therapy in my generation. I hope. Um, Nina says her daughter is nearly 10 months old and has a nasal tip hemangioma which is mixed. We are in the UK. What is the earliest we can have laser? The baby's 10 so, months old. 
Yeah, so with the, with the nasal tip, you have to uh, start treatment early. Um, laser can be helpful depending on how thick it is. You might really need to do systemic treatment with the propranolol or hemangiol, which is um, available in Europe. Um, because you definitely, it's a very sensitive area and you want to make sure that those little cartilages at the nasal tip don't get displaced. That can be corrected surgically later, but you want to try to avoid that. So it may be combined treatment with laser, oral propranolol, and also maybe some topical timolol, which we often use in conjunction. So it's definitely uh, not too early to start now. I, I would definitely think that um, if you're not already on treatment, you should be at least on the oral treatment. That may be the most important right now. Um, I like this question because I've actually brought this up with Dr. Nelson. Um, Sista says when her, port, her son's port wine stain is less visible when the climate is cooler. We know this. Yeah. Now she said, but if we do a procedure in an air conditioned room and the port wine is less visible, will the laser be? less effective. Now, I just want to say, this is why I tell all the moms to outline the birthmark with the, the white crayon, because yeah, when you do go in a cool room, you can lose a little bit of that stain, but I'm sure you'll address this question, but I find it a very interesting one. Actually, I think it is a good question, but surprisingly, my laser room tends to be a little warmer because <laughs> the laser generate a lot of heat. So um, I guess that takes care of itself in my office anyway. So I like the idea of outlining them. I outline them before I start because sometimes I find when the child cries, definitely there's more flushing. So then whatever went away because of the cold comes back because of the apprehension and the anxiety. So it's important to mark because sometimes the whole face will turn red. And uh, if you're treating the face, it might be hard to find the birthmark to some extent, especially if it's uh, become lighter with, with effective treatment. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Lysandra says, Dr. Duarte mentioned something called Latouche and Rogaine for hair thinning. Is this something that can be used for, say, for thicker eyebrows? Yeah, so um, always check with your dermatologist um, and everybody's a little different, but Latisse can be used safely. Um, it's like, it's just like one drop um, I think the teeth will work well. It's a little bit more expensive. Um, also the 2% Rogaine, you can just put a little thin, thin film on there and see if that helps. Thank you. Um, so I don't, this Kalani Burbank is asking a question. I've never seen this one. I've never heard of this. She said, I'm sorry, I'm late attending today's session, but what about propranolol? I hear the use of this can cause hemangiomas to implode in children, any studies in adults? I've never heard of it imploding. In well, I think it means implode, meaning involute, probably involute. So definitely hemangiol, which is the, the brand name for propranolol, which is FDA approved, um, found to be safe and effective um, for the treatment of infantile hemangiomas, uh, is what we use as the gold standard for treatment of infantile hemangiomas in, in infants uh, and, and children. So the first thing is if you're an adult with an, inf with an infantile hemangioma or a hemangioma, we have to make sure the diagnosis is correct because usually most of these will be gone by the time, even without treatment, which we advocate for treatment. But let's say you never got treatment by the time you're 10, usually most of this will be gone. Of course, you may be left with residual scarring and fibro fatty changes, which we don't agree. Um, should, we don't agree these lesions should be left to do uh, what they will do uh, on their own. So, but let's just say that it has, right? And now you're 40, you wanna make sure you have the right diagnosis before you start to use treatment. But um, I don't really know of using propranolol in adults because this is, tends to be a problem that occurs in children. So I would be suspect of the diagnosis. Great, thank you. Um, I think this might be, well, we may have one or two more questions because we're wrapping up. We're in our last four minutes. It's, been so busy and great session. Uh, Lindsay said, you started to mention that you have not seen many or any cases of overgrowth or cobbling on the scalp. My son's port wine stain is a V3 and goes up into the scalp. I'd like you to reaffirm, like, what, can there be overgrowth and cobbling in the scalp? Yes, there can be. 
but for some reason we don't tend to see it that often so it's something that we need to keep a pulse on in your child in particular so it needs to continue to get checked but on the scalp you know you have to really weigh the risk benefit especially if you can have prolonged hair loss uh, stunting of the hair growth and even a residual thinning so you really have to weigh that out, but we don't tend to see it. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's not that common. Yeah, I think I'd like to re reassure her a little bit that in 27 years and after looking at probably 200,000 images, I don't think I've personally seen cobbling or overgrowth in the scalp, unless it's been a really voracious port wine stain that really like has had overgrowth problems right from the beginning, like a really intense, right. but in- Or like a malformation, right? A different diagnosis, right. venous malformation, female right. malformation. Exactly. Um, oh, so uh, Tara's saying that she gets blebs. She I get more blebs than anything on scalp. Tara so, yeah, I would say you might get a little bleb here and there, which that can be addressed locally with maybe right. a little cop without laser, without having to laser right. the whole area. So. Oh, so um, our last question, Kalini, I think Kalani is talking about um, being told she has hemangiomas, but she's an adult and you know how that can be mis a misdiagnosis. And she said she's had many hemangiomas since birth, one on her spine that caused her to be paralyzed from a cord compression. Um, I heard of medications, but they contain sulfa. Are there any other options that aren't expensive or that may be covered by insurance? I think you should just, you could come to our conference and you know see Dr. Rosen and see a top team um, if, in fact, you're being told you still have these because I don't know what your history is. You could feel free to email it to me and I can put you in touch, but it's kind of hard without knowing all the facts. Um, yeah, this, the whole you, spinal compression part of that, I mean, that's not typically what infantile hemangiomas will do. So we have to see really what's going on there. Was there an associated arterial venous malformation, something in the spine? Um, yeah, I think that you'd really benefit from coming to the clinic in October. Yeah, and we're hoping, I'm really working hard on convincing Dr. Berenstein to come, uh, Dr. Alex Berenstein, um, who's, you know, very well known and one of the most famous, well, he is the fam most famous neurointerventional radiologist. And for these complex cases like yours, uh, Kalani, he'd be great. It's an oh, it's an ABM? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, um, so it's an AVM. So then you should definitely come to our conference and have Dr. Coletti do the ultrasound if in fact it is an AVM. Um, so last question, Giotti wants to know, can you elaborate a bit on an aggressive hemangioma? I guess a lot of parents don't know, like is my child's hemangioma normal hemangioma, aggressive, mild? So uh, we don't tend to use the word aggressive, but um, there's right. some that rapidly proliferate. They grow very quickly. They might even, because they grow so quickly that they outgrow their blood supply, they even may ulcerate. That's the most common complication we see with hemangiomas. These ulcerations can be painful. Rarely they can get infected. Rarely they can bleed quite a bit. So to me, this would be a, a serious hemangioma, um, not necessarily aggressive. They don't invade tissue per se. So they just they can just by virtue of occupying space and ulcerating and bleeding and scabbing and crusting can can be very painful and and difficult to live with. So definitely these kind of lesions should be addressed early, get under the care of a physician. But those would be on the extreme case of a patient with a very, very, um, as you mentioned, aggressive, but rapidly proliferating, rapidly growing, um, expanding infantile hemangioma, as opposed to a small little lesion that's superficial that could be maybe a centimeter or less, um, which is really innocuous and and. and it's the entire spectrum. It's the same condition uh, with two very different phenotypic presentations. 
Now, I just really want to squeeze in, even though it's two o'clock, if you can do a quick answer, I don't know. But Olivia has a good question. She says, um, her son is 15 months old, but he developed an acquired port wine stain at four months of age. And they've done a MRI of the brain and neck and there's no ABM or other malformations. Um, she just wants to know, I mean, she could come to our super clinic. I've seen acquired stains with lymphatics, but I haven't, malformations, I haven't seen an acquired stain with, you know, just pop up out of nowhere. Yeah, so depending on the skin type, um, something popping up at four months of age might have been there um, and not really that clinically obvious. So some babies are born quite red, um, especially very, very white, white Caucasian babies. And so sometimes these stains were there and, you, and it just wasn't picked up. I, I would have to see the baby and see, but I don't think it's so unusual in the first four months of life to start picking things up. Um, acquired port wines, we usually reserve that term for patients that develop them, let's say in adolescence for the first time ever. So I don't think it's so unusual. Okay, very, very last question. I love it. Can a port okay. wine stain, oops, sorry, I didn't, I couldn't hear that you were still talking. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I lost the audio on you. Um, can a port wine stain and a hemangioma coexist in the same child? Yes, yes. We see that from time to time. Absolutely. Hemangioma are so common um, that so many babies have those that, of course, some patients may have both. Well, it has been a phenomenal session, very busy. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Duarte, for being with us today. And anyone who's listening, you can go back and rewatch this. We put them on our YouTube channel. We have them from January of 2017. They are valuable resources for you. You can go back and listen to Dr. Duarte, Dr. Nelson, Dr. Geronimus, Dr. Wainer, Dr. Coletti. We have all the experts doing Facebook Live. Stay tuned next month. Our Facebook Live will be with Dr. Geronimus um, out of in New York City on I think it's September 24th or 25th, but you'll, you'll see an announcement about that. So stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Duarte. We will see you at the Super Clinic in October. And um, stay safe as well to you Thanks. and all of your loved ones. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Linda. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye. It was fun. Bye. Yeah. Uh,